Spider-Man. He's back in action. He just collar rock Gimby's whole game. Hello, hello, hello. This is me and my friend Pete, the podcast that explores all things THE Amazing Spider-Man. I'm your host, the mighty monologuing motormouth himself. They call me Gerald. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If it isn't, welcome, 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 welcome back. This week, we're running through THE Amazing Spider-Man number 19, Spidey Strikes Back. If you haven't already, please consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash HSPP in the Key Keeper or High Council tiers, where you gain access every week to a bonus episode of me and my friend Pete covering a comic book pull from High Society's extensive vault chosen by you, the listeners. This week, we're covering the Immortal Iron Fist number one, The Last Iron Fist Story, part one. And you know when Daniel Rankai is in the building, there are going to be bullets and fists flying. The man with the iron hand is back, ladies and gentlemen, and I promise all types of martial arts violence. That's later. Right now, we've got fist and feet flying in the fashion district, the perfect place to reintroduce the fanciest Daniel, Fancy Dan. And you know if the diminutive Dapper Dan is in the building, the ox in Montana can't be far behind. We've got the Enforcers. And you know if the terrible trio are in the building, we've got a heavyweight villain to lead them. This time, none other than the smoothest of criminals, the human hourglass, the two-gun man, Flint Marco, a.k.a. the Sandman. But Spidey's not alone in this handicap match. For the first time, officially, we've got Spidey teaming up with the Long Island Igniter, Sifu Hot Rod himself. I'm talking about Jonathan Lowell Spencer Storm, known the world over as the Human Torch. He didn't start the fire, but blamed if he won't bring the heat. And we've got me, we've got you, we've got, no further ado, we've got THE Amazing Spider-Man number 19, Spidey Strikes Back. And Darth Vader, eat your heart out. Me and my best friend Pete, old adventures, new critiques. He spins webs, I spin yarns, kinda kooky, be forewarned. Look out, it's me and my friend Pete. So before we jump into The Amazing Spider-Man number 19, there was another title in December of 1964 that Spidey showed up in. It was The Avengers number 11. The mighty Avengers meet Spider-Man. And the only blurb we can write is, Wowee. I promise you that's the title. And this was written by Smiling Stan Lee with incomparable illustrations by Don Heck, dazzling delineation by Chick Stone, and lacrimose lettering by sparkling Sam Rosen. In this tale, Iron Man is dead. I'm liking it already. The bureaucracy of this thing is amazing. We get a full page of Cap motioning to suspend affairs for the day to honor Tony Stark. The Wasp seconds that motion. Giant Man says he votes to keep operations running, but to give Iron Man a temporary leave of absence. At this time, they didn't know Iron Man and Tony Stark were the same person. Rick Jones, the Hulk's quote-unquote friend, seconds the motion, and Captain America snaps, telling Rick he's out of order because he has no voting privileges with the Avengers, then seconds the motion himself. And finally, Thor chimes in, sounding as if he's just flew in straight from Washington, D.C. He says, It is so moved and so carried. Iron Man is granted a temporary leave of absence, and the Avengers remain on active duty. I hereby declare this meeting adjourned. There's a podcast that I loved when I was younger and it's still up on iTunes called Tom vs. the Justice League of America. And every issue of the Justice League that he covered sounded just like this page with Batman always upset he was stuck doing the paperwork. Hilarious and worth a listen. But the giant super teams of this time must have just been sitting around making up convoluted rules and bureaucracy until it was time for action. And do the Avengers got action? Because none other than Kang, the Conqueror, is spying on them from the year 3000, where he makes a statement that has become one of the greatest unresolved Marvel plot threads ever. That Doctor Doom, the Latverian Lion, 
is his ancestor. That's way too much convolution to get into, but if anyone wants me to dive in, let me know in the comments because I found some answers. Anyways, King's going to use a robot to attack the Avengers while the drunken Iron Avenger is dead. At first, King wants to use one of the great villains of the age, but worries they'll fight each other. So instead, he decides that THE Amazing Spider-Man is the perfect person to copy because of his loner tendencies. Using an Atomo duplicator, which I promise you is nothing more than a 3D printer with a much better name, and an isonuclear duplicator to input Spidey's strength, knowledge, personality, and memories, Spidey Robot Man is on the scene. The scene? Captain America, the star-spangled Avenger, being jumped in an alley by Berber Gang 3000. Secretly, more King robots flung into the past. Spidey Robot Man traps them all in a web net and asks Cap to join the Avengers. They meet up with the other Avengers who refuse to let Spidey join, but spring into action when he tells them he knows where Iron Man is, that he's been caught by Baron Zemo, the Executioner, and the Enchantress, and they have him in a temple in Tirod in Mexico. And the Avengers spring into action, deciding to split up and travel to the same location as his, quote, standard operating procedure. But wouldn't it be easier to travel to... I know, Hot Rod, I know. But this is clearly before Quinjets and Common Sense. So Ant-Man and Wasp fly to Mexico as stowaways on a jet, reach the temple, and are immediately attacked by Spider-Robot Man, who makes short work of them. He takes out Thor next, separating the god from his hammer, Mjolnir, and webbing him up. This was during the time when Thor couldn't be separated from Mjolnir for more than 60 seconds or he turned back into his human alter ego, Donald Blake. Captain America parachutes onto the scene and Spider-Robot Man gives him the work too, webs up his face and pushes him off the side of the temple to certain death. Kang, watching from the future, is loving what he sees until his robot sprays a web line and saves Cap's life. King thinks the robot's gone wonky and acts fast, telling the robot to send all the Avengers to the future now. Before Spider-Robot Man can, however, he's webbed around the neck from behind by the real McCoy, THE Amazing Spider-Man, who webs up the machinery so nobody can be transported and starts talking his talk, baby. Did you think you could prowl the streets of New York impersonating me without my own spider sense warning me of your presence? And the two get into it right away. Spidey flings the fake miles away from the tower before both fighters craft web wings on their arms and take to the skies. The amazing Spidey birds. Spidey swoops down towards the imposter, tosses his wings to the side, lunges forward, and manages to shut down Spider Robot Man as they tussle in the air, sending the fake crashing to the ground and crafting a handy dandy web parachute. He floats away with Cap having been awake and trapped beneath webbing the whole time, witnessing the entire battle. He knows Spidey just saved his life. He knows Spidey's a hero. And if I'm not mistaken, this is his first interaction truly with the real Spider-Man. First impressions go a long way with Captain America. What we don't ever find out, however, is how Spidey got to Mexico, how he knew his doppelganger attacked the Avengers when none of them mentioned it to anyone in New York, and how he got back home to the mean streets of Forest Hills, Queens. But we do know that this tale takes place after the one we're about to get into, because if you recall, our hero has had a rough go of life in these last two issues and hasn't been out in the world as a crime fighter for two months. That all changes right now. As they say in Mexico, vamos a entrar en él. The credits on this one. This bad boy was written by Spidey's godfather, Stan Lee, illustrated by Spidey's big daddy, Steve Ditko, and lettered by Sam Rosen, Spidey's second cousin on his uncle's side. This is a family affair. And my people, if the S and S and S connection wasn't working in this one, I don't know work. And I've worked at a barbecue restaurant known for its wings on Super Bowl Sunday. That's 5,000 pounds of chicken wings, barbecue sauce everywhere. I still have dreams of hot rod. That was another time, another life. All that to say, I know work. Back to the cover of this one is a beauty. Written on top of the page, we've got the amazing Spider-Man and Spidey New Roman in red with blue shadow in the word Spider-Man. This is written on top of spider webs as usual, but the spider webs are extending past the Spidey New Roman and stretches over the entire page on top of a white negative space. Beneath the Spidey New Roman, we get a green screen caption box. 
In small white letters it says, An adventure epic of most compelling excellence. And in large goldenrod letters, Spidey strikes back. And beneath this green screen box, we've got none other than THE Amazing Spider-Man. His legs out in front of him, his arms too, his hands gripping a web line as he speeds towards us, every muscle flexed, his buggy eyes narrowed. Spidey is focused. Stage left, we have an image of none other than the Sandman in a sky blue box. His arms and legs all sand as usual. We haven't seen this man's hands and feet in months. Beneath Spidey, we've got the greatest gang to ever come out of Marvel Comics Silver Age, none other than the Enforcers in a sky blue horizontal rectangle. That's Montana in a dark blue blazer, lime green collar shirt, his white hat as wide as his shoulders, and you know he's swirling that Honda in his right hand, holding the lasso in his left. Next to him, stage left, we've got just the man all hands, the fanciest Daniel, Fancy Dan. His skimmer hat yellow with a purple and black band, his blazer blue jade blue, his shirt Yankee pinstripe, his tie goldenrod, Fancy Dan. And finally, next to him, stage left, the ox. You already know, the enforcer's muscle keeps it simple. That small black vest on top of yellow turtleneck with thick collar, his brown hair, tousled. He's not here to sexy anybody out. Here I am thinking Spidey's got redemption on his mind and we've got four people who've beaten him before right here on the cover. But if they think Spidey isn't going to bring a ruckus in the next 22 pages, they've got another think coming. As they say in the Bronx, let's get into it. Page one opens to the sign of the spider on a goldenrod colored banner next to the title of this issue, Spidey Strikes Back. Directly beneath this, in a white negative space, we get a pink caption box, stage Right. Featuring guest stars, super villains, super thrills. In a circle caption box stage left. One of the most eagerly awaited action dramas of all time. We're told this is one of the most anticipated action dramas of all time. And in the center of this page, we got Stephen J. Ditko working. My brush, please. In the background, his lower half a sand tornado, his brown hair wavy, his mouth slightly open, both his arms giant lobster-shaped sand claws, we've got the Sandman. And he's trying to wrap up none other than the Long Island Igniter, the Human Torch, whose left arm is trapped in the Sandman's left lobster claw. The torch is hunched over in the air, his right arm pressed against his bent legs. Why? Because stage right on the ground, we've got Montana, his body leaning back, his left foot wrapped in its Chelsea boot on its tiptoes. He pulls back hard on his lasso that's wrapped around the human torch. He has hogtied the Long Island Igniter. While this scene is going on in the background, Spidey's toiling away in the foreground as the ox, both ham sized fists clenched, bears down on our hero who has both arms out in front of him, his right leg pressed against the floor and his left knee raised to block the left straight punch coming from the diminutive Dapper Dan himself, Fancy Dan, who's so cool, he's got his theater lift cigarette in the side of his mouth the whole time, still chilling. Below this four on two action, we get recap and caption boxes. Due to his aunt's serious illness last month, Peter Parker spent all his time at home looking after her. That meant, of course, that Spider-Man was out of action too. People began to think Spidey had turned coward and he was powerless to change that mistaken idea. But now, his aunt is no longer dangerously ill. And so, watch out. We turn the page. Are you comfortable? Are you relaxed? Do you have time to read this whole story through without interruption? Please don't start unless your answer to all these questions is yes, because the action starts right now, and it doesn't stop till the last page. Ready? Okay, here comes the thriller of a lifetime. And the story opens to a guy wearing an advertising board on his chest and back, a walking advertisement known back then as a sandwich man. He's got on an SJB Newsy cap and orange collared shirt. And on the sandwich board on his chest, it reads, Spider-Man washed up. Read the Daily Bugle. Editorial on the Spider-Man myth by J. Jonah Jameson. So Jameson is still playing his trumpet quite loudly and quite obnoxiously. There are a guy and a dame behind the sandwich man and they're all staring over their shoulders towards the door of a bank as no less than five suited men in Newsy caps and fedoras come bursting through the doors in dead sprints. The Berber gang has hit another bank. If it seems like banks are always getting hit in these early stories, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko were born and raised during the Great Depression, known for its hardships, but also for the constant robbing of banks, so it may be a little art imitating life. 
Either way, the Berbers are getting busy. Each member has a cliched yellow money bag in his hands. We've got brown fedora, purple cross hat suit, screaming that the job was clean. Green jacket, SJB's, brown fedora, screaming they'll reach the getaway car and be in the clear. So you know that's Badger and Pee Wee respectively, right? And when you have Badger and Pee Wee, you know eventually we'll have the sign of the spider. It illuminates the ground at the feet of the fleeing Berbers as Badger screams, the spider signal. And where you got the signal, you got the spider as Spidey falls down towards the Berbers in the next panel. Sneaky Pete in an olive suit and brown fedora screams it's Spider-Man. Badger screams they thought he was out of action. Nails chimes in that Jameson's paper has been calling the webhead a phony and a coward. And Spidey cracking Sneaky Pete and Badger easily across the jaws and bouncing from the floor in a handstand screams, You believe it, boys! But just imagine what I could do if I wasn't a phony coward. The Amazing Spider-Man is quipping and just like that, the Amazing Spider-Man is back. And Rocky is wholly unimpressed. In an SJB suit and purple fedora, he shouts for the gang to rush Spidey. They never learn. In the final panel, Spidey gets right to work. He does a modified planche balancing on three fingers and knocks Rocky quiet. That's three fingers. Spidey pushes off those three fingers and clubs Pee Wee and Sneaky Pete with a fist each while backflipping and before landing, clubs Badger and Nails across the jaws. There are hats flying, suit buttons flying, words being eaten left and right, and the whole time, Spidey is talking his smack saying this is just what the doctor Ordered. Dr. Fam wrote out a prescription for one butt kicking in the middle of the street. Page three opens to Spidey getting spidery. Running horizontally in small hops along the sheer wall, he is throwing left overhands like Martin Gwynn, knocking three Berbers out in quick succession. He says for them not to crowd before realizing he's running out of opponents. Nails throws a panicked haymaker, but Spidey leapfrogs him easily screaming, hmm, I guess you're the last of them. Hold still, cutie. This will only take a second. If you were wondering where Jesse Pink was during this melee, he was keeping chicky. Translation, standing lookout. And as the crowd watches Spidey working, Jesse breaks away from the scene, running into the foreground, thinking he's got to warn the boss. The Berbers are working for a higher power. Spidey leaps onto the sheer wall of a building in the next panel, thinking the police are coming, so he won't be needed. He shouts down at the crowd. If anyone asks what happened to you guys, be sure to spell my name right. There's a hyphen in it. Remember, please say the hyphen. A short time later, in a lecture hall not far away. We have a woman in a purple dress, her hair in a tight bun, standing at a podium. She's introducing none other than John Jonah Jameson Jr. The subject he's going to be discussing. How I prove that Spider-Man is a cowardly fraud. And we get JJ in the foreground, green blazer, red tie, his Reed Richards working, and his eyes closed in JJ joy. He's thinking, ah, what a happy moment. As a man in an SJB suit, the car Winslow spinning on top of his head, taps the miserable magnet on the shoulder and whispers that he's heard some disturbing news. And we get a gorgeous three panels of the conversation between Jameson and this guy whose name is Wormley. In the first, Jameson is still wearing his two issue eyes closed smile as he tells Wormley not to spoil his triumph. But Wormley insists there's something Jameson needs to know. Jameson says he'll listen after he's destroyed Spidey's image. Wormley says the news can't wait because it's about Spider-Man. And Jameson's eyes pop open, wide and confused. His smile becomes a grimace. Wormley says, The whole town talking about it. There was a gang of bank robbers. And then Spider-Man appeared and single-handed he... And Jameson's frown lines, missing for an entire issue, have returned. As Wormley talks, Every inch of JJ's face becomes wrinkled, and he suddenly looks like a 55-year-old man again. The negative space has gone from goldenrod to red. It's magnificent frame-by-frame -frame work. The panel of the week this week? These three. Jameson's halfway out the door as soon as Wormley finishes speaking. The brown-haired woman screams for Jameson to wait because he has to expose Spider-Man. She asks Wormley why he's dipping out, and Wormley says the miserable magnate doesn't feel very well. And I bet he doesn't. You love to see it. Four opens to Jameson on the street, pounding his fist against the side of a building in aggravation and frustration and every other Asian, I'm sure. Screaming that Spidey's return can't be true and he can't be wrong again. While he's floating down the Nile, the human torch is in the sky. Flames on. He spots JJ having a mental breakdown and minds his own business. Well, I've no time to worry about him now. I've got to reach home before my flame dies out. That last fight I had, 
Oh, but exhausted me. Johnny's talking about Strange Tales number 127, where he and Benji Grimm took a hiatus from the Fantastic Four before being lured to a rocket drag race in the salt flats of Utah and getting into a fight with a mystery villain who turned out to be none other than Snoops Richards, proving the point that he could bully his teammates and ignore his wife when they dared stand up to him. The second story in Strange Tales that month, Doctor Strange faced off against Dormammu and met Clea, a white-haired sorceress who would go on to become his disciple and lover. It was a great issue. Back to. So Johnny's flying by, minding his own business. But as the human torch glides to a landing near his home, an asbestos-covered lasso snakes out and... The Honda of the lasso, that's the loopy in for first-time listeners and non-cowpoke, loops around the torch's legs as the lasso wraps around Torchy up to his waist. Someone screams, got him from off panel, and you already know it was none other than the laureate of the lariat, Montana. And he's not alone. The enforcers, villainous teamwork on, best ever, do what they do best, encourage each other. Ox, looping the lasso around his fist, screams to Montana that his throw was good, and now he's going to reel the torch in. Montana says Torch has been flying a long distance, so he's probably too tired to be able to do anything with his fire. But we all know Torch has grit, and he's not going to take being attacked lying down. He immediately goes airborne, hurling fireballs at the Ox, who screams, Fancy Dan, get over here! Hurry! Answering the Ox's call, the third member of the evil enforcers rushes up, carrying a cylinder filled with chemical foam. And Fancy Dan is on scene with an SJB color backpack that looks like a Ghostbuster proton pack and starts spraying fire extinguisher foam all over the torch, screaming. You didn't expect us to be unprepared for your little tricks, did you? This will put your blasted flame out. He yells to the Sandman that the torch is all his and the torch's flame, exhausted from the surprise attack, goes out completely as he's jumped in the final panel by a wave of sand with Two Gun Marco's head, who screams, Good, the phone makes it impossible for him to fly, and now I can do the rest. Sandman smothers the torch to open five, knocking the junior member of the Fantastic Four out cold. He begins reconstituting himself as the Ox drags Torchy away, saying, Good work, Sandman. I'll take care of him now. Ox always ensuring he gives encouragement and credit where it's due. Sandman says thanks, but Torch is only the first. They're going after every crime fighter in the area until they're all wiped out. As none other than Jesse Pink runs up in a green flat cap with shock red hair screaming, he's got big news for Two Gun. He says Spider-Man's back in action and has just collared Rock Gimpy's whole gang. And Sandman snaps. Quiet, you fool. I don't want the enforcers to hear. They only joined forces with me because they figured they wouldn't have to worry about spider Man. In the background, Montana, with the help of the Ox, is lifting the Human Torch into the back of a truck. They are kidnapping the Long Island Igniter. Later, at their hideout. We're in what appears to be a warehouse and we see Johnny in an airtight glass prison cell, unconscious. We haven't seen the Tinkerer in a while, but this definitely seems like one of his creations. Either way, Torch is sleep sleep, while the Sandman, Montana, and Fancy Dan stand around the glass prison talking. Sandman thinks the cat's out of the bag, telling Fancy and Montana that he's heard Spider-Man's back in action and stopped the bank robbery. He adds that they don't have to worry about Spider-Man because if they meet, he'll handle Spidey like he did before. But the Sandman has never handled Spidey. The only reason he even has a win under his belt is because Spidey refused to fight. Montana or Fancy Dan have more claim to talk and smack like this because they're consummate professionals and actually managed to drop the wall crawler one time. I saw it. It was... Unbelievable. Fancy Dan says Spider-Man being back is irrelevant because it's too late for them to back out now and walks over to a wooden table, lighting a cigarette. Ox walks up saying, who cares if Spidey's back? That's a one on four and Spider-Man's got no chance. Sam throws his leg up on a chair in a Captain Morgan pose, agreeing they've got nothing to worry about. Look how easy we caught the torch. He's helpless in the glass cage now with only enough air to survive for a while. Fancy, seated comfortably holding his theater cigarette, his eyes closed and head thrown back, says next they have to find out more about Spider-Man. In the final panel, Spidey is web swinging high above the city as he's wont to do, and you know he's monologuing, giving the game away. Not a bad night's work. I sure wish I could have seen J.J. Jameson's face when he heard the news. I'll bet he hit the ceiling. And he's right. The sun is down as Spidey reaches his house to open page six. He peeks through May's bedroom window where he finds her sleeping and thinks that's a load off his mind that she isn't ill anymore. He swings into his own bedroom in the next panel, pulling his mask from his face 
as he does. He says he needs a good night's rest because he can't have Spider-Man falling asleep during a fight. And Pete must be delirious. Who does he think he'll be fighting? He didn't mention any beefs. We know the Enforcers and the Sandman are plotting against the Webhead, but who Pete's talking about, no one knows. He's up bright and early in the next panel and walking into the kitchen. SJB slacks, golden rod vest, and red striped tie. He's still tying his tie as he speaks to May, who's standing at the stove in a green, full-length dress and white apron. He says, oh, excuse me, I must be in the wrong place. What's a pretty young girl doing here in my Aunt May's kitchen? And May replies, Peter Parker, go along with you now. You know who I am. And I am loving this energy. Pete sits down at the dining room table and May says she feels a lot better thanks to Pete and Mrs. Watson. And Pete says of course he was going to look after his aunt. He couldn't take the chance of eating someone else's pancakes. If you recall, May's wheat cakes are Pete's favorite food to eat in the whole world. In the next panel, we have May in the foreground smiling in profile as she tells Pete she's glad he's in a good mood because she's been worried about him lately. And what else is new? Pete, sliding his suit jacket on, returning the smile says he can promise May that she doesn't have to worry about him from now on before heading out to school. And in school, the king of Foolsville, Flash, fashion on trash Thompson, is back on top of his mountain in a green turtleneck and tan slacks talking to his peons in the background. We've got Bruni, boy and girl, Sandy, boy in a sky blue shirt and brown slacks, and a blondie girl in green. In the foreground, Pete's resting an arm on a counter near a globe, staring back at the group. He's thinking Flash is back to being Mr. Popular again, while Flash dominates the floor as he does. I was right about Spidey all the time. I told you, he's the greatest. Bruni girl says, you sure did. Bruni boy asks Flash if he'll be starting up the Spider-Man fan club again, and Flash says, of course, that he never gave it up. In the final panel, Flash breaks away from the crowd, smiling from ear to ear to catch up with none other than the blonde bandit, Liz Allen. She's wearing a purple sweater and a red turtleneck and a slight annoyed look on her face as she looks back at Flash. Pete is watching all this from the corner of the room, wearing a scowl. Flash says Liz will be singing a different tune now that the webhead's back, greater than ever. Liz says that's great, but unless her memory's gone bad, Flash was mad at her. And Flash was mad at a lot of people, but he snapped at his friend Bowtie Charlie and Liz for telling him Spider-Man was washed up. This was last issue when Foolsville became a lonely place for Midtown High's greatest athlete. You know we've got the story here. That's the Triumphant's Trumpets, where Flash and Spidey were both going through it. Seven opens to Flash telling Liz he's not mad at her anymore because he's too happy to be upset with anyone. Liz says she's mad at him, so it doesn't matter how he feels. We've got Pete eavesdropping as he does in the foreground, and there's a slight smile cracking on his lips as Liz storms into the next panel with her chin held high and her eyes closed as Flash asks why she's upset with him, completely oblivious to his transgressions as usual. And Liz shows she can throw her words around. She replies, You had the unmitigated nerve to be mad at me. That's what. Good day to you, Mr. Thompson and storms off. Flash stands thunderstruck with his mouth open. I'm not gonna say that female is nuts, but if I wasn't so batty about her, I'd have my doubts. And Pete says you can't win them all, guy. Does Flash snap? Does the Empire State Building have its own zip code? Wait, what? Flash spins on a spot, jabs a finger at Pete, and goes off. Look, Beauty Parker, you butt out of my affairs, see? Who do you think you are, sneaking around and listening in on people's conversations? And Pete's not soft. He gives a menacing smile as he replies, With that foghorn voice of yours, I can hear you in the next town. Population, the loneliest number. Called him Foghorn Flash Thompson. And Flash chooses violence right away. Telling Pete he's going to make him chew on a set of knuckles. Pete throws his hands up walking off saying he can recite this song by heart. Like... Sing a different tune, Flashy boy. This one's getting old. In the next panel, Pete has his hands on his hips watching Flash return to his group of friends. And Pete's thinking, Burns me up that Spider-Man's biggest fan has to be a weak-witted, muscle-bound, lame brain like him. I wonder what he'd do if he ever found out who Spidey really is. But then, after school is ended, Pete turns the corner thinking he can finally get suited and booted into his Spidey gear when his Spidey sense goes off as a short, stylish man in a purple suit and yellow skimmer hat walks past him. He follows the man into the next panel and realizes there's only one guy that fashionable roaming the mean streets of New York. As Fancy Dan exhales a thin line of smoke from his theater cigarette, Pete thinks that if the guy's parading around town that way, he must be up to no good. But to be fair, the fanciest of Daniels is always parading around because he's as stylish as it gets and wants the world to know it. 
In the final panel, we see the golden liability suited, yes, booted, of course, perched on a sheer wall as he watches Fancy Dan entering a building, and Spidey is thinking. Well, Dan, you my mind? Oh, Spidey will just see where you're headed for. Him. And I'm thinking Spidey's headed for trouble. We turn the page and we're on... The Infinity, 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 Infinity Page. Page 8. Just in time to witness Spidey on the ceiling above a staircase, still tracking Fancy Dan, who's strolling down a hallway casually. Spidey thinks he hears doors opening behind him, and he's right. A guy in an olive shirt and green pants, and another in an SJB shirt and green pants, come out of a side door, stage right. Olive shirt screams for Fancy Dan to look out. SJB screams, it's Spider-Man. And in no time at all, the hallway is packed with goons, and a certain laureate with the lariat. A sandy man screams, it's their big chance. Montana shouts, he won't get away from us this time here. Yeah? And Spidey, chomping at the bit, stands upright, upside down, thinking, Well, if I want an action, I sure found it. I stumbled into a whole nest of criminals. Translation, it's time for the showdown. And we got action. Twelve years before Wolverine and Colossus teamed up for the first official fastball special as members of the X-Men, the Ox, and the fanciest Daniel pulled it first. Ock grabs Fancy Dan and hurls him at the ceiling towards the wall crawler, shouting that Fancy will make a great battering ram. Dan slams into the web pad's back with his arms crossed and a smirk on his face. And after complimenting Ox on his great toss, gotta make time to encourage your teammates, crashes to the floor with Spider-Man into a crowd of three burly goons. An auburn haired goon shouts not to let the webhead recover. A Sandy shouts that this is gonna be a pleasure while he's racing forward. But Spidey's a lot more graceful than the fanciest of Daniels. Dan's landed on his butt, Spidey's landed on a handstand, and he's not gonna let the Goonies pounce on him. He leaps up from the floor, shouting, <laughs> Sorry, boys, whatever falls down can always bounce up again, if it happens to have spider skill. As the three men rushing him collide in a pile of shoulders and fists, but Spidey's not out of the woods yet. Montana screams, and whatever bounces up can always be corralled by Montana's lasso. From off panel when the action's on, as usual, before hurling his lasso at the webhead. The Honda slips around Spidey's shoulders in the final panel, a gorgeous panel that sees Spidey upside down, Montana yanking back on the lasso. He screams that he'll hold Spider-Man while Ox gets some free swings in. And the Ox lumbers forward, throwing his patented left hook, screaming that one punch ought to do it to put the Spider-Man down for good. But even lassoed, even upside down, Spidey is still able to dodge the Ox's punch. Ha! When Ox screams how he rolled away so easily, Spidey replies, I ate my weenies this morning. What else? So you know that's a shout out to Wheats. The action spills over onto page nine as Spidey leapfrogs Auburn hair while slipping free of the Honda at the same time. Spidey shouts that it feels great to be back into the fun and games again. He's calling this fun and games. This is a little lunch for the webhead. A gray haired man in an olive shirt runs forward with his sleeves rolled up, shouting that they're gonna knock some of the confidence out of the webhead. And he is immediately knocked out in the next panel as Spidey lands on both feet, throwing his left fist at gray hair and his right at Auburn, snapping both of their chins to the ceiling. Where's the last position you wanna be in the fight with your chin staring at the ceiling? Yep, that's it. But Spidey's not out of the woods yet, or the hallway rather. Fancy Dan leaps on him from behind, screaming to the gang to give him a hand. Spidey tosses Fancy Dan aside, shouting, a hand, even an elbow and a couple of shoulders wouldn't help. Hey, look out! As the ox rushes forward again, connecting with a right cross on Spidey's armpit, sending our hero sprawling. Ox screams that he knew the blow would rattle the webhead. Spidey plants into the next panel, calling out to Meathead and saying the blow only rattled him a little before singing. All hail the spider, a hearty breed is he. Tra la la. Montana screams Spidey's cracked up before Spidey cracks him up with an up and undercut from the planche while slipping through the lasso man's Honda. No problem. Agility best ever. And all the ruckus has led the police to the location, late as usual. Three B cops race towards the staircase, the lead officer asking what's going on. And the guy keeping Chicky, you know I love learning 60s slang, so you know the guy keeping Chicky at the top of the stairs, shouts a warning to his gang. Hey, Amsker, you guys, the police are coming. While in the same breath, shouting to the officers that this is all just a friendly little party. All the goons begin racing for exits as Spidey leaps to a sheer wall asking where all the party poopers are going because he was just beginning to enjoy himself while thinking, darn, the enforcer slipped away in the confusion. In the final panel, Spidey is scaling the outside of the building, 
fleeing the scene thinking that it won't be long before he and the enforcers meet again. And next time, it'll be for real. Spidey only considered this a warm up. A short time later, at the newspaper office of J. Jonah Jameson. Payson opens with Pete in his goldenrod kid outfit, walking through the Daily Bugle when he spots the damsel, never in distress, Betty Brand. She's wearing a pink shirt with white frills poking up from the collar and a red cross hat skirt. Her bob, flawless. She's facing someone we can't see who's wearing a green blazer with black checker print. Pete wonders if she's going to be friendly with him again. And you know Pete's rule. There's only one way to find out. He shouts, Hi, Betty. Long time no see. In the next panel, we see it's the sandy-haired boy from last issue that Betty went to the movies and got a soda pop with. Handsome kid. He's wearing a friendly smile. Betty tells Pete she's glad to see him and that she has someone she wants Pete to meet. Introducing him to... Ned Leeds. She says, This is Ned Leeds. He's a reporter for the Daily Bugle. Ned, this is Peter Parker, the boy I told you about. The two shake hands, both all smiles. Pete's not a hater. He tells Leeds his lance to meet him, and Leeds says, likewise, Parker. Ned says he's got to get back to the city desk, and that it was nice meeting the Goldenrod Kid. Pete says, see you around, still smiling. In the next panel, Betty goes hand to chin immediately in profile. She says, Peter, I, I don't know how to explain. I've been seeing quite a bit of Ned. And Pete, all class, replies, nothing to explain, Betty. He seems to be a nice guy. Why shouldn't you see him? Betty's smile returns as she tells Pete he's so understanding and that she thinks she's treated him so. Pete waves away her lead into an apology. Still smiling, he says forget about it and excuses himself to speak with Jameson, who's just exited his office. As Pete steps away, Betty goes hand to chin again, staring at his back through the corner of her eye. And she thinks what we're all seeing. He seems so changed all of a sudden. He seems to have new confidence in himself. I wonder... Can he have found someone else? Meanwhile, JJ is stomping through the office like Sasquatch back in his foul, foul mood. A man, rocking a car Winslow in a purple shirt and bow tie, asks if JJ will mind. But before he can finish, JJ tells him to shut up and go away because of course he minds. A sandy man in a sky blue collared shirt tells JJ he has the new galleys for JJ to give his okay on. A galley is a preliminary version of a publication meant for review by the author, editors, and others within the publishing house. Translation? A final draft of the Daily Bugle in this case. And JJ snaps, his tie swirling, his cigar clenched in the side of his mouth. He shouts, Don't waste my time with that junk. Can anyone think for himself here? Am I surrounded by incompetence? As his employees all look on laughing behind his back, saying that Stoneface is back to normal and they knew his good mood couldn't last. Pete approaches JJ to open 11th, and JJ, screw-faced and upset, calls him a pest and asks him if he has any pictures for him. Pete says, no sir, but, and JJ isn't trying to hear, no buts. He's a busy man, and with Spider-Man back on the scene, he's way past busy enough. He screams, stay out of my way unless you have some photos for me. I haven't time to waste on every teenage nobody who comes along. And slams the door in Pete's face. <laughs> and Pete isn't bothered. He thinks that he was just going to ask if J.J. wanted picks up the Enforcers, but decides he's going to get him for the miserable magnate anyway. Meanwhile, back at the Sandman's hideout, a conference is taking place. Sandman, Ox, and Montana are talking in the background, saying Spider-Man must be stopped for good, as Johnny the Human Torch looks on from his glass cylinder cell. Fancy Dan walks up in the next panel as Montana says, But how are we all going to catch hold of Spider-Man? And Sandman replies, It'll be a cinch, Montana. Don't forget our ace in the hole. We've got the perfect bait for our trap. His bratty pal, the Human Torch. But Torchy calls Sandman a fool, saying Spider-Man's no friend of his. I'm going to give Sandman credit here. He's pulling a play out of Dr. Doom's playbook in ASM number 5, Mark for Destruction by Dr. Doom, when he kidnaps Spider-Man to lure the Fantastic Four into a trap. That's the golden liability. Always another day here on Me and My Friend Pete. And Sandman must have loved the story. You will too. Back to. Two Gun says they'll see soon if the amazing Spider Man and the Human Torch are really friends and walks off with the Enforcers. And I imagine they're all laughing their boot laughs. <laughs>, laughs. Thoroughly enjoying the control they have over the situation, Johnny repositions himself into a squat as soon as they leave, lamenting, If only I had more air, enough to let me flame on. He lights a finger on fire, thinking if just one finger could hold a flame, he'd be able to break the glass. But Two Gun doesn't need a high school diploma or to be friends with Snoop Richards to know the basics, and he's designed this thing with just enough air to keep the Long Island Igniter alive and not an ounce more. Torch on his hands and knees realizes if he flames on, he'll suffocate. And now, 
Hold on to your hats, friends. Here comes some of that high tension action we promised you. Spidey is suited and booted, web swinging high above the city, as he's known to do, screaming that before he takes on the enforcers, he's gonna pay a visit to his favorite hater, J. Jonah Jameson. Spidey lands upside down outside of JJ's window. The lights are on, the busy man is hard at work. And Spidey says, Hi, Smiley. Did you know I was back? Spidey's waited all this time to call the man Smiley, and now the guy's not smiling. How rude. And JJ starts wagging his fist right away, screaming that he's gonna get Spidey, he's gonna drive him out of town and find some way to beat him. Spidey really just dropped in to irritate the miserable magnate. He swings off seconds later, screaming as he does. Sure you will, Sweeney, but forgive me if I don't hold my breath while I'm waiting. JJ leans out of his window, screaming into the dusk. I'll get you, do you hear? I'll get you! But Spidey's already long gone. He lands on the sheer wall of a building, thinking it's time to get down to business, and he knows just how to do that little thing. After a half hour of patient silent waiting, Spidey perched comfortably on the side of a building, finally spot who he's waiting for. The stool pigeon we first saw back in ASM number 10, The Enforcers. That's BCC Dr. C.K. Connors, How to Plan, here on Me and My Friend Pete. And the weasel's wearing a green newsy cap, an olive jacket, purple slacks, hard bottoms, and a strand of webbing on each shoulder as Spidey yanks him from his feet and up the side of the building. Petrified, he screams, S spider man wh what do you want from me? Spidey, upside down and face to face with the man, replies, Just a little information, Louie. The kind of stoolie like you is sure to have. Stoolie Louie, the weasel. Spidey tells Louie that he knows the enforcers are back and he wants to know where they are. And loose lip Louie lets the information slide right away. They're in the old warehouse across from Clancy's gym. And they got the torch prisoner too. According to the Sports Illustrated story, Clancy's gym is Danny's turf by Harvey Aronson on March 23rd, 1970. Clancy's gym is on West 28th Street off 7th Avenue. Smack dab in the heart of New York's Garment District, better known today as the Fashion District. If you're a fan of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, starring the amazing Rachel Brosnahan, her father-in-law's garment shop, is in the Garment District. The poshiest Peter Parker is headed for Style Town. He web swings away and the weasel shows he's got some gumption. He slides out of his jacket, still webbed up on the side of the building, and climbs down, thinking he has to warn the Sandman fast. I don't even want to know the type of risk the weasel was taking to get out of that jacket. But what was he supposed to do? Spidey was going to leave him there. It would dissolve. He was going to fall to his death. This weasel's got moxie. And Spidey, web swinging towards the scene in the same pose we saw on the cover, is thinking that Louie talked too easy, and he's sure there's a trap waiting for him. And he's right. In the next panel, Sandman is literally holding the phone and looking over his shoulder talking to the enforcers and a gang of four goons behind them as the Human Torch looks on. Sandman says, he's on his way now. I don't want any slip up, see? And Fancy Dan steps forward saying Two-Gun doesn't have to worry because they're not exactly amateurs. And to be fair, the Enforcers are the only gang without powers to ever drop the webhead. Look, I'm never gonna get over that. Spider-Man reaches the warehouse and his Spidey scent begins tingling non-stop. He clings to the sheer wall of Clancy's gym and scopes out the scene. No wonder they have lookouts all over the place, but I've still gotta make sure the torch is okay. 14 opens with Spidey beneath the lip of a rooftop as a goon in a tan newsy cap and SJB jumpsuit hides behind a pillar keeping lookout. Spidey thinks, a sentry has about as much chance of spotting me as he'd have of spotting a runaway amoeba. Amoebas can't be spotted with the naked eye, and neither can Spidey. He calls into the next panel beneath an awning above another lookout hiding behind a wooden crate. This is almost too easy. If I wanted to be sporting about it, I'd sneeze or something. Spidey scales a sheer wall while a guy in an SJB flat cap peeks his head out from around the corner of the wall, saying that the webhead wouldn't dare come around to where they are. Spidey thinks the observation is profound, but <laughs> the observation is wrong. Spidey perches outside of the warehouse and stares through a window at the torch trapped in his cylinder cell. Sandman and company have taken extra precaution and added a light brown weight on top of the torch's prison, just in case the kid thought he was getting free. Spidey thinks that Louie was right and that he's flattered this game will go through all this trouble to stop him. He sets up his camera on a web line and descends upside down in classic Spidey pose thinking, and now it should be a breeze to smash that tank. It's finna be a breeze. But no, that light brown weight was really, what? The Sandman. 
and Two-Gun unfurls into his sandy sheet form, waving a large lobster claw-shaped arm at Spidey, who calls him a tricky old geezer, before leaping through the Sandman's body. Sandman's undeterred. He shouts, get him boys, and we got action. 15 opens the Sandman sliding from the top of his prison as the torch shouts for Spider-Man to look out. But Montana, from off scene when the action's on, as usual, has already snagged the webhead's arm and pulled our hero horizontal. And Ox is already on him, throwing a left straight punch that connects with Spidey's thigh. But the hits just keep on coming because Fancy Dan is already rushing forward with his dazzling footwork. And after telling Ox that was a good shot and Montana to tighten the lasso, he says they're going to finish Spidey off fast and right hook Spidey in the back of the head. My people, this is all in one panel. Spidey's about to be downed a second time by the enforcers. But Spidey's got grit and he always commits. He pushes off of his left hand towards Montana and upside down throws an up and undercut that knocks the Chelsea booted Montana off his feet easily, screaming. You gotta be faster than that, boys. You're in the big leagues now. And Spidey starts throwing fists. Right side up in the next panel, Spidey snaps a gray suited man's head back with a backhand fist while at the same time throwing his right arm out to his side, knocking out a green jacketed goon. Spidey is firing on all cylinders, but the Sandman wants his piece. Spidey doesn't see the sand tentacle snaking beneath him. And that's rough, because Two-Gun uses it to grab Spidey from the air before clubbing the webhead across the jaw with an anvil arm in the next panel, screaming. Ha, you didn't expect me to slither under you in my sandy foam and then suddenly come up behind you with a pile driver punch. Did you? And Spidey, his right arm thrown towards the ceiling, his body heading towards the floor says, now that you mention it, no. But what's Spidey agility on? You know they know, I know. And he's on his feet in no time asking Sandman if he thought one punch was enough to stop Spider-Man. He says while Two-Gun thinks about an answer, he can have a little web in his eye to stay busy. But you know the enforcers want to stay busy too. Before the webbing's out of Spidey's shooter, Montana's Honda is wrapping around Spidey's arms and torso as Fancy Dan leaps onto his back. But Spidey does a front flip to open page 16, huh. screaming no free rides like he's Demolition Man, sending Fancy Dan flying, while at the same time tugging Montana's huh. dragging the laureate of the lariat towards him. His shoulders on the floor, he throws a downward right hand, connecting with Montana's jaw again, talking his smack. Montana, in case nobody's ever told you, there's a big difference between tossing a lasso over someone and making it stick. Maybe you want to try using a net for a while. Spidey is working these enforcers. You think the regular goons with no fighting skills will get out of there, but they've got moxie. They scream now's their chance, and two of them, a tan fedora and a brown newsy cap, try to tackle Spidey while he's on the floor. But Spidey is deep in his agility now. He goes matrix on his right foot's tiptoes. That's it. His whole body's weight on five tiptoes and drops Newsy Cap with a downward left and Tan Fedora with an up and undercut. And we have two more bodies hitting the floor. Spidey does a kip up into the next panel, but immediately has his legs knocked from under him by the Sandman, who's transformed himself into a giant ball of sand. And I'm starting to think Sandman was made to run with the Enforcers. All his moves are teamwork setups. He screams, keep after him, Ox. He can't maintain that pace forever. Get him now while I have him off balance. And Carpe momentum is in full effect. Ox shuffles forward and catches Spidey flush with the right hand. Now, Spidey's chin is facing the ceiling, but the kids got the grit. He cartwheels over two goons in the next <laughs> panel, shouting at the Ox that he's sorry he can't be more cooperative, and he hopes he's not giving the one and only Ox mental traumas. Spidey cares. Two more goons rush Spidey, shouting to let him have it. But Spidey leaps <laughs> over them easily, telling them not to kid themselves because they have nothing to give. Whipping. But Spidey gets serious to open 17. He lands on both feet, catching the fist of the ox with his left hand, who's running up swinging a right again. And after telling the six foot eight bruiser that he's tired of the man mountain taking swings at him, cocks a right of his own back and slams it into the ox's gut. Spidey hit the ox so hard the man's mouth is formed in the shape of a perfect O. All the air is gone from his lungs, I'm sure. And Spidey's not done. In the next panel, he brings the hammer down hard with an overhead left, sending the ox flying as he screams, Usually I have to pull my punches with other guys, but with you, I can really let myself go. Ah, that was like a symphony. Spidey, 
playing the music of the Golden Liability. It sounds something like fist, swing them if you got them, fist, swing them if you got them. I imagine that's the tune. Sandman throws another anvil arm pile driver punch that Spidey dodges by leaping straight up at the same time, pushing his hands out to smack away Montana's Honda. And he wonders aloud if Sandman ever gives up. Sandman doesn't answer. Sandman's working. Both fist anvils, he throws one straight and slams the other into the floor, but he's gotta be quicker than that. Spidey tucks, Spidey rolls, and he's up and over both fists, no problem. But Spidey's thinking that he's starting to get bushed. He's got a plan, however. He knows there's one way he can get a little rest. We get a gorgeous panel from behind Johnny, the Human Torch, who's up in his cylinder prison, his left hand pressed against the glass, his right hand clenched in a fist, and I'm sure he's bouncing on the balls of his feet like Christian waiting for that tag from the spotlight hungry edge. And Spidey, still in a ball, is racing towards the cell. He crashes through it in the next panel and torches on fire and in flight before the glass hits the floor. The tag has been made. He shouts, Flint! No, no, he shouts, Boy, you sure took your sweet time about freeing me. Spidey lands on his left foot, screaming. That's gratitude for you. Some guys are never satisfied. And he stays low as Torchy accuses Spidey of trying to hog the whole fight for himself. Just before he starts hurling fireballs. Left hand, right hand, he's not messing around. The torch has come to play. Sandman goes 90% sand immediately as Torch swoops around him and both in fire, screaming. Of all the crummy luck. Now we got two of them to fight. Sandman's already faced the torch in Strange Tales number 115, and the torch gave Two Gun the work. So Sandman's not eager for a rematch. And Torch says, Count your blessings, because if my fantastic family was here, you'd really be in trouble. Huh. As Spidey leaps and chin checks Fancy Dan in the background. A goon in a tan suit and green fedora, acting fast, throws the fire extinguishing proton pack on his back and unloads on the human torch, dousing the flames around the young hero's legs immediately. But Torch doesn't panic. He hurls a fireball at an orange flat cap goon who has a fist raised in Spidey's direction and asks the webhead to handle the fake Ghostbuster. And Spidey's got his back. He shoots a line at the nozzle ASAP. Does Spidey get the hit? Of course he gets the hit, saying anything for an old human matchstick. And Torch turns the heat up. He surrounds all the goons not named in Forces or Sandman in a whirlwind of fire, telling Spidey to slap his webbing on him. Spidey, racing beneath the Long Island Igniter, lets both web shooters fly doing just that little thing. The two hamming it up the whole time. Hey, you know something? I hate to say it, but we make a pretty good team. Bite your tongue, hothead! The bromance is now solidifying, but the big bads of the issue refuse to be beaten. Sandman stretches to nine feet tall, shouting at Montana to use his asbestos dip lasso again. And Johnny, agility nowhere near best ever, is hogtied in less than a heartbeat as Montana lets fly. Sandman seizes the moment, wrapping his arms around the human torch as the Ox and Fancy Dan jump onto Spidey's back in the background. This right here is the page one splash unfolding. And Spidey tells Torch he'll have him free in a flash but Torch calls Spidey mother and says he wants to free himself. But Spidey doesn't take orders in the middle of a fist fight. What does he look like to you? An Avenger? Spidey hurls his body along with the ox and Fancy Dan as like five, six hundred pounds at the Sandman in Montana. And they all go sprawling. Spidey lying and saying he was going too fast to stop. He wasn't going too fast. Who do you think you are telling me what to do? You were the trap guy, not me. In the final panel, Torch throws a high wall of fire around Montana and Fancy Dan, trapping them in place as Spidey asks the Ox why he doesn't have sense enough to stay down when Spidey knocks him down before uppercutting a seated on the floor Ox out cold. 19 opens to Spidey and Torch racing out into the hallway in pursuit of the Sandman who's reconstituted himself into his body minus the lower left leg which is still sand and he's racing up the hallway screaming over his shoulder. You won by dumb luck, but you'll never get me. Or run run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the same man. Spidey shouts that he'll cut off two guns escape with webbing and lets fly from his right web shooter. But Torch flies into Spidey's line of sight and they start a three stooges routine straight out of the funny pages. Torch says, you clumsy chowderhead, you tripped me with that nutty webbing of yours. And just when I was about to grab him. They both try to stop Sandman again. Spidey shooting more webbing, Torch flying in his path and the two get tangled up in the greatest invention in the whole world. Torch flames off as Spidey tries to tear his webbing, 
but he can't. It's too strong. We'll just have to wait here for a while till it kind of melts off us. Johnny says we're not doing that. He knows Spidey's webbing is asbestos treated, apparently, I guess, and says a white hot concentrated flame will get them out in no time. Spidey, holding the web net above his head, watches and compliments Johnny, saying, Hey, not bad, Torchy. Why didn't you get out of that glass cage of yours the same way? As the torch, his hand glowing white hot, burns through the net, reminds Spidey that oxygen is needed to start a fire, but if he's got enough air, nothing can stop him. Johnny helps Spidey free himself from his webbing to open page 20, lamenting that the Sandman's gotten away. And Spidey says, Nuts! He's the one I was most anxious to get after the hard time he gave me last month. They race down the hallway together, keeping up a, you can say it, running dialogue. And Torch replies, Yeah, I remember that. Everyone thought you turned chicken. What made you run out on that fight with the Green Goblin anyway? But Spidey's not here to answer questions. He asks if anyone ever told the Long Island Igniter that he asked too many questions. Meantime, before the two colorful teenagers can reach their almost exhausted quarry, and Sandman, almost at the home stretch, racing past wooden boxes and crates, is spotted by two police officers. One named Mike, so I'll assume the other's name is Ike. And the two police officers tackle two gun immediately. Sandman screams that nobody can hold him. He's going to turn to Sand and escape again. But he doesn't know that Mike and Ike ride mechanical bulls on weekends. And despite his best attempts to send them flying, they hang on for dear life. Ike's hat goes flying as he screams, Not this time, mister. We'll hang on to you even if we have to scoop you up with a pail and shovel. And the Sandman, all tired out from his battle with the Golden Liability and Long Island Igniter, realizes he has to surrender. His chin on the floor, his body morphing from sand back into man, he says he surrenders as long as he doesn't have to face Spider-Man and that flaming freak again. Ike, wrestling Sandman's right arm behind his back, says, Spider-Man, the reports must be true. He is back in action fighting crime once more. And Mike, doing the same with the left arm on one knee, chimes in. And more power to him as far as I'm concerned. In the final panel, as Spidey leaps onto a sheer wall, stage left, huh. Johnny tousles his own hair and says the police have everything under control, so there's nothing left for them to do. But Spidey replies, there's still one thing, the thing you always do. You're trying to get all the credit while I take a powder. So long, Junior. Spidey's gonna get out of there. Remember when Spidey's performing? He lives for the applause. But when he's tackling knaves and being brave, he doesn't need an audience helping because he can. Great power. You already know the rest. The next day at Jameson's office. Jameson is in the foreground in the same olive suit, both arms up near his face as he leans on a filing cabinet, his left hand running through his hair, his cigar in his mouth. He is completely defeated as Betty in the background, red and black striped shirt, pink skirt, holds a phone receiver and delivers bad news. Have you heard the latest news bulletin, Mr. Jameson? Spider-Man, aided by the Human Torch, captured the Enforcers and chased the Sandman into the arms of the police. Jameson replies, That means he's a hero again. I wonder if I'm too old to join the Foreign Legion. Before hopping up and pacing through his office, monologuing with his hands behind his back, smoke clouds trailing him. How did it happen? Just a short time ago, Spider-Man was public heel number one. Everyone called him a yellow coward. And now, he's more glamorous than ever? How? How? Pete walks in, his goldenrod kid outfit, flawless as usual, shouting at Jameson's back that he has something to show him before holding up a stack of photos in the next panel. These may make you feel a little better. They're a full photographic record of the fight between Spider-Man and the Enforcers. Can I just say I'm always impressed by how Jameson's cigar never falls from his mouth despite being in complete shock every time Pete delivers pictures. And of course JJ is in shock. His demon photographer has done it again. They're sensational. If they're not fakes, they'll sell an extra half million papers for me. An extra 500,000 papers. Jameson, the Daily Bugle, they are doing the Dunder Mifflin on a whole different level. 500,000 extra copies? What type of paper numbers is JJ doing? Miserable magnate for sure, but his safe must runneth over. Pete, his hands in his pockets, a scowl on his face says, they're not fakes. But Pete doesn't have the right to be upset. When he fought the Sandman in Midtown High, he faked the pics at the end because he forgot to set up his camera. That was ASM number four, Nothing Can Stop, The Sandman, or King Oswald, King Janitor, here on Me and My Friend Pete. Back to. Spidey thinks that JJ is an old pirate and he doesn't want to give the guy the pictures, but he needs the dough. Jameson, his eyes wide, his mood lifted, says he'll take them all. 
Pete, exiting Jameson's office and tucking his cash into his breast pocket in the next panel, stops in front of Betty, asking her if she'd like to celebrate his first date back on the job with a soda. But Betty says she can't, as she has a date with Ned tonight. And Pete replies, all smiles, that's so. Well then, maybe I'll see you tomorrow, huh? And Betty returns a smile and says that'll be fine. Of course, Cosmic Timing has Ned Leeds walking up at this moment, his sandy hair curly, his green blazer checkered. He calls Pete Fella and asks how it's going. And Pete says things are fine and tells the young couple to have a great time tonight on their date. And Ned says they'll do their best. Pete makes tracks in the next panel, telling Betty he'll call her tomorrow and bidding both adieu. And Ned's impressed. He says, that Parker seems like a nice guy, Betty. As Betty's smile becomes a grimace and she thinks that Pete seems so unconcerned. Hands to chin. Final panel, of course, as she thinks, I secretly hoped he'd be a little jealous. But he doesn't seem to care. Have I really lost him? But Pete's a smart kid. He knows he blew it, and even more important, he knows how to move forward. What does Betty want him to do? The kid wants her happiness more than anything else, and she seems happy. Plus, Pete's only two years removed from being a lonely wallflower. He doesn't know these games the cool kids play, and I think, even if he did, he wouldn't play. You're projecting, Hot Rod. Back to the final page opens to a crowd reaction shot of a group of men reading the Daily Bugle, and they have words. Green flag cap says Jonah Jameson did it again, providing the public with action-packed photos of Spider-Man. Guy in shadow and fedora says, but just the other day he was calling Spidey a fraud. Sandy-haired middle-aged in maroon bow tie asks if Shadow understands publicity before telling him JJ only ran the whole Spider-Man menace campaign as a stunt and he bet Spidey's working with the miserable magnate. As Orange Skimmer Hat chimes in, saying he wouldn't be surprised at all. Meanwhile, on 42nd Street and Madison Avenue, we're outside of the Baxter building as Johnny and Reed talk inside. Reed asks, Did you ever find out why Spider-Man seemed to act cowardly last month, Johnny? What explanation did he give you? And Johnny replies, None. Getting information out of that web spinner is like pulling teeth. I still can't even make up my mind whether to like him or hate him. But Johnny's frightened. He knows they're friends now. But he's a little Long Island uppity, so we gotta forgive him. Well, outside Midtown High at 3 p.m. The Golden Rock Kid and Liz Island say goodbye to one another, and Pete heads for home. In the foreground, a man in dark glasses, a black fedora with a purple silk band, and the JJP suit holds a small notepad in his left hand and flicks a cigarette butt from his right. He's thinking, Petey, he's the one. He follows Pete into the next panel as Pete thinks, It's great to have things back to normal again. I haven't a worry in the world now. In the next panel, the sun's gone down and a crescent moon hangs over May and Pete Parker's home in Forest Hills, Queens, as the man in the black fedora stands beneath a telephone pole smoking another cigarette. He thinks that Pete's turned his bedroom light off a while ago, so it should be okay for him to check in now. This guy's been watching Pete for hours. He calls up his mystery employer who, his face blanketed in shadow as he holds the phone to his ear, tells the guy stalking Pete to get back to his post because he wants Peter Parker under surveillance every minute. We can't see anything about this guy's facial features. He's got a white hand and he's wearing a green robe and maroon pajama pants, but that's all we see. He hangs up the phone and walks over to his bay windows, draped with blue curtains. Staring out at our modern day Rome, he thinks that he's gotta know for certain. And when he does, when he's sure, he's going to act. And the final panel is a large red question mark and beneath it, a caption box. What's this? It seems that a new and different menace is about to enter the life of Peter Parker. Be prepared for the unexpected as surprise follows surprise in our next shock-filled issue of the magazine that has become one of America's most favorite reading habits, The Amazing Spider-Man. And we're out. My people, talk about action, talk about adventure, talk about romance, talk about bromance, and the words of my brother Juju, talk about it. This is the type of bounce back Spidey needed and he came out confident. He came out strong. He came out swinging. Pete's now in two love triangles. TNT no drama, they learned it from Stan the Man. And you're only as good as your allies and enemies in this superhero game. And was the torch not torching? Sandman so far has had the best team up success with the team working toughs. And I'm gonna go ahead and say it. My old favorite villainous group was probably the Wrecking Crew. But doing this podcast, Montana, The Ox, and the fanciest of Dan's, Fancy Dan, are now top of the list. The Enforcers. They support each other, compliment each other's skills, call each other out when they're not pulling their weight, and give Spidey high-level arachnocarnio every time they pop up on the scene. 
I love to see them. And the way they have been drawn and have gone about their work, Ditko knows action like Stan knows drama. That's the main episode this week. And that's true. That's the main episode. But there is more Me and My Friend Pete available for your listening pleasure right now. If you support this show on Patreon.com, patrons get a bonus show every week where I've run through comic books from all over the multiverse of comics, past and present, from Marvel to DC to all points in between. This week, we're focused on the big if, the immortal Iron Fist number one. A story that begins, in my opinion, one of the greatest Iron Fist stories ever written. If we've got comics, we've got history, and I'll be your guide through it all. Join me. Head over to patreon.com slash hspp and sign up to the Key Keeper or High Council tiers now to learn what happens when the fightiest of Dan's, Daniel Rand, takes off the blazer, loosens up the tie, and fights a hostile takeover of Rand Industries the only way he knows how, with fists and feet flying. I just want to say shout out to Michigan and California one time. I don't know who you are, but I see you. That's love. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, a special thanks to the home team. That's the right minders, the big three, the key keepers in the high council. Parker's 11. This podcast is completely listener supported and your support keeps this crazy train on the tracks. I'm truly grateful you keep coming back and more grateful you allow me to be the conductor. You got questions? Send them to me in my friend Pete at gmail.com and I'll go digging for the answers. Please like, please comment, please share, please take care and please think of the world and be true to yourself. And remember, with great power, you know the rest. Make sure you're being responsible. I'm out of here.